Uh, we're going to move on to the second topic now, which is risk factors. Frank, I'll begin with you. In December, JP Morgan published a report pointing to the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, which saw inflows of almost $2 billion compared with outflows of $7 billion for ETFs backed by gold. This was for the period of October uh, to December of 2020. JP Morgan predicts the trend will continue with gold suffering at the hands of Bitcoin. My question to you is this. If JP Morgan's calculations are correct, it suggests that Bitcoin only accounts for 0.18% of family office assets compared with 3.8% for gold ETFs. So tilting the needle from gold to Bitcoin would involve the transfer of billions of dollars. Um, how do you make a case against this risk? Well, okay, that's easy. And you have First five minutes. Okay. First of all, I, I, and I'm going to have to talk fast here, but um, I, I think I've, I don't ever listen to what Wall Street, anybody on Wall Street has to say about things that are more often wrong than they are right. But assuming the Bitcoin is going to continue to be accumulated at the rate that it was and measuring that over a period of a few months, you might as well be throwing darts. That's just not, that's just, that, making that kind of assumption doesn't make any sense. But I think assessing and quantifying risk is the biggest issue facing Bitcoin. I've said that earlier, and it's one thing that Michael likes to sidestep or, or, or gloss over. He doesn't feel it's necessary to worry about those risks, brushing them off as black swan events that will never happen. But these risks are real and they're predictable. They're not unpredictable. And it should be taken into account um, before buying Bitcoin. And again, I don't think that it should prevent people from buying Bitcoin, but they need to give some weight into that risk. And as I said, the biggest risk is going to come from central bank and governments. When and if Bitcoin becomes large or popular enough to be perceived as a threat to currency, and, um, and especially the US dollar, and they will go work very hard, and this has been proven throughout history, to try and squash that opportunity or severely damage it. Um, governments need to control their currency. Uh, they need to have that monopoly. And uh, I, I just don't see, because they need to manage both their fiscal and monetary policy, and in order to do that, they have to control their currency. So uh, for whether you like it or not, that's the way it is. And um, uh, I think that they also need to control taxation, and that's both taxation that's direct and indirect. And taxation by inflation, which is their, is their current preferred method, means that they can monetize all this tremendous amount of debt that they're producing, um, and you, the consumer, are paying the tax through inflation. Does he actually believe, does Michael, and here's the question, does he actually believe that the government is going to stand by and allow Bitcoin to subsume all the value of gold, and maybe the, and he's also suggested the entire value of the bond market. I just don't know in what universe he thinks that governments will allow that to happen. Uh, I, I think it's sheer insanity. You just have, you have to ask yourself this every time you look at you know th this sort of a movement: is what happens when the interests of the powerful, with the law on their side, are pitted against anarchists? And in this case, the anarchists are, are the Bitcoin. I just don't see how they're going to let that happen. And again, they don't need to deal Bitcoin a death blow. They can do it with multiple cuts. And what that might not take Bitcoin out, but it will sure change its investment proposition and therefore its performance. And the attacks can come in any form, okay? And I think the easiest is legislation. Um, and simply banning uh, Bitcoin, making it contraband, or making it illegal for uh, ex uh, Bitcoin exchanges to accept fiat for Bitcoin would wipe out all the institutional buying, most sophisticated investors, and drive Bitcoin underground. Um, and it would certainly take a lot of the air out of the Bitcoin price. Uh, the F if, the F if it were banned and the FBI requested records from the exchanges, they would give them up. All exchanges are tied, to all points of connections and exchanges are tied to the US dollar system. So it's very difficult to escape tracing or, or, or monitoring. And, and who's going to take the risk if there's prison time uh, is the penalty to leave a trace on their computer? I just don't see why anybody would take that risk. So there's, that's one approach. The other one is more direct. You know, they can hack. Uh, and I know that they can certainly do sustained hacking on the on and off ramps into, in, into Bitcoin trading. 
Uh, and if, if you think about it, if, if the U.S. defense network can be hacked with backdoor, secret backdoors built into the hardware, who's to say it can't happen with, with, with Bitcoin? And I think, again, you have to take those risks into consideration uh, that they're real and they exist. Now, I've heard the argument, and this is how the argument comes back from all the Bitcoin people, is that, oh yeah, there's a handful of senators that are Bitcoin friendly and are going to provide cover for the Bitcoin investors. And you know, that's going to matter just as much as those handful of politicians that are pushing, proposing legislation to make gold and silver money in order to avoid tax. That's never going to happen either. So I, I just, I, I just don't, I don't get it how they're going to let this, let, let this happen. And they will always use the excuse the government, that is, that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. So I don't think that you're going to get the kind of protection that, that, that you're hoping for. Thank and governments, governments will use any excuse knowing that the real reason is going to be to protect their monopoly on currency and keep their ability to execute monetary and fiscal policy, but they'll use other excuses if they want to go after Bitcoin. Crime, consumer protection, the environment, you know, they can say, you know, the, you know, Bitcoin produces more CO2 emissions than, you know, a billion cars, um, uh, money laundering, and the catch-all phrase, national security. And if they can use national security to renegotiate bilateral trade deals, don't think, don't think that they can't use it if Bitcoin becomes a threat to the currency. Central banks, again, I go by the golden rule. They own the gold, they make the rule. They have $7 trillion worth of gold. They're not about to allow some other asset class to, to be a store of value to, subs, to subsume that, that, that value. It's just not going to happen. Um, Thank you. Frank, wrapping comments, please. Okay, well, I just think that um, I have other points with respect to countries, central banks creating their own digital currencies. They're all, everybody's looking into China as the most advanced and they're not going to want the competition. And if Bitcoin gets big enough, they will go after it and eliminate it. And that's just the way the world works. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Michael, you will now have a one minute rebuttal to that. The central banks don't own any Bitcoin. As soon as one country starts to buy Bitcoin for their central bank, the price is going to rip. First point. Second, um, U.S. dollar is going to be the big winner from the spread of Bitcoin. Five billion people are going to have a mobile wallet on their phone. They're going to have a currency layer running on lightning rails or running on a compliant payment rail. will have the U.S. dollar, might have the euro. The big losers are going to be the bottom 50 countries. They're going to lose their currency privileges. All the collapsing economies in Africa, South America, and Asia, they won't keep their currencies. People will, uh, will switch over to the dollar. Uh, Bitcoin is critical to U.S. technology supremacy and the U.S. dollar supremacy, and one day five billion people will use the U.S. dollar as a currency. I don't think the government's going to fight it. I think the government's going to embrace it. And uh, will the government stand by and let Bitcoin grab gold's uh, capital share and part of the bond market? Well, they allowed the, the growth of the Vanguard 500 and the S&P 500 and ETFs and bond mutual funds and gold ETFs. I think that as long as the assets sit in regulated banks and custodians, they won't have a problem with insurance companies and investors investing in Bitcoin rather than an S&P 500 index fund. Finally, uh, will, will there be a political pushback? Well, there's two to three million people a week that are buying into Bitcoin around the world. Coinbase added a million a week in the first quarter just on their platform. Bitcoin's the most popular investment asset in the history of the world. It's the most popular asset in the world. It's spreading like wildfire. By the end of this year, more than half of the U.S. voters are going to own it. Thank I think you, it'll Michael. be politically popular. Thank you, Michael. And you'll get a chance to speak uh, more about this because uh, I'm sticking to this topic here under uh, risks um, in your question. PayPal co-founder Peter Thiel has said, uh, that Bitcoin could be used as a financial weapon against the U.S. and that it threatens, uh, you know, fiat money, but it especially threatens the U.S. dollar. So, you know, if it is a real threat, why isn't it conceivable? Why couldn't we see the Fed and other central banks stop Bitcoin? You have five minutes to continue uh, your point I here. 
I think Peel, uh, Thiel's comments were misinterpreted. What he was saying is it's going to be the base layer for the 21st century fintech economy. The lieutenant governor of the China Central Bank just embraced it as an asset, not as a currency, and said, and uh, under proper regulatory regimes, it would be appropriate for an investor to own Bitcoin. So I think the sentiment is evolving amongst uh, leading politicians. Risk factors. Here's my thought about risk factors. Gold invites violence. Alexander, you know, gallivanted around the world to seize gold. Livy tells the story of 1,000 Roman sieges in order to steal the gold. Caesar sacked Gaul to take their gold. Kublai Khan seized the gold. Pizarro seized gold from the Incas. Cortes seized gold from the Aztecs. Charles I seized the gold from all the British nobles. The Prussians seized gold from the French in 1871. In World War I, everybody seized the gold. Lenin seized gold from the church in 1922. Roosevelt seized everybody's gold in 1933. Stalin seized the gold of the Spaniards in 36. Churchill took everybody's gold in 1940 at the onset of the war. At Bretton Woods, the United States seized the world's gold and then you know, took it hostage. And then Nixon killed all the hostages in 1971. Gold's always getting ceased. The problem is you can't secure gold. The cost to secure it goes up with the number of nodes or caches of gold, the value of the gold in the cache. It's regulated. You have to secure it with guns, people, steel, concrete, carbon. It doesn't scale. If you want to stress test it, you ask yourself the question, when I give this thing to 5 billion people, how much is it going to cost me? So gold transportation costs don't scale because the more transactions, the more the value of the transactions, the more jurisdictions, you know, brings more cost and more regulation. And you need guns, people, vehicles, and carbon is too expensive for most transactions. Gold audit won't scale because the more nodes, the more transactions, the more value, the more cost, and the regulators get involved. It's very people intensive. It's infrequent, slow. It's unreliable. It's a risk factor. Gold security transport and audit are regulated by every nodal jurisdiction. They're corruptible, they're uncompetitive, they're antiquated, they're elitist, they're ineffective, and they're out of reach for 99.9% .9 of the population. The gold applications, what we call paper gold, they don't, have, they don't have any technical protocol with integrity, so they're all corrupted by hypothecation, regulation, and inflation. Bitcoin security transport and audit are pretty effectively free. They're effective, they're unregulated, they're egalitarian. Everybody has the same rights. A, a person with $100 of Bitcoin has the same security as someone with a billion dollars of Bitcoin. There's competition to continually improve the services. They're decentralized. The security nodes are decentralized and they're protecting the interest of the holders from local violence, local regulation and local corruption. Is the Bitcoin miner in Iceland or the North Pole or Siberia or China protecting the interests of somebody in Manhattan or Ontario? And it's a beautiful thing. Gold's physicality and indestructible nature, they invite malefactors to kill you and take your property. Bitcoin safely stores your property in cyberspace where it can't be seized by force. And that encourages peaceful negotiations rather than coercion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Frank, you will now have a one minute rebuttal for that. Yeah, you're right. You know, th there have been a lot of wars, a lot of blood and treasury spent on protecting gold over the century. And that's why, you know, it's, it, I, you're making my case that gold has real value. Uh, people have fought very hard for it and they're not about to give it up easily. And so I, I'm not sure that that, that makes sense. Um, and again, I prefer physical gold. You keep coming back to the paper gold. I agree in some ways about paper gold. So, I, I, but I don't think those issues apply to physical gold. Um, the cost to secure it, but listen, again, you, you're, you're not accepting the fact that as Bitcoin, if it achieves the value of gold as you're suggesting, it's a sitting duck. It's sitting out in the open and can be easily attacked. I would r rather have my money in a safety, uh, my gold in a safety deposit box than out in the open where once it's a threat to the currency and you can't deny that 
it's not going to be a threat when you, you, you know, you, you said the U.S. dollar is going to benefit from this. I don't know how you can possibly say that when you're talking about 20% money growth every year now and forever. It, that, that's how you destroy a currency. The U.S. dollar is not going to benefit from this. And Bitcoin is not, if Bitcoin pretends that it's going to provide the solution, they will kill it. It's that simple. Do hit the like button and do subscribe to our channel.